Today I'm going to talk uh, about not sulfates, other salts. There are other salts besides sulfates, <laughs> uh, particularly chlorine salts. And well, I had this, but really we've seen it a few times now. So of course, there's this non-icy material that has been purported to be magnesium sulfates um, in a few different papers. Uh, but I want to talk about chlorine salts. So just to uh, <clears throat> start at the basics, uh, we have a bunch of different types of chlorine salts. So the one that most people are familiar with are chlorides. That'd be like the Cl minus, so NaCl, KCl. Uh, but there's also some interesting oxidized chlorine species, so chlorate and perchlorate. And here's their structures down here. And they form salts just like chloride does, so NaClO4, um, magnesium chlorate, and things like that. And uh, I know Mars is a dirty word here, but um, <laughs> perchlorate was found on Mars, and that kind of really started a lot of people in the planetary community, think, including myself, thinking about that these oxidized chlorine species. And where else could they exist? You think about Europa, lots of water, oxygen, chlorine, could perchlorate exist there too. Uh, and one thing that's important to distinguish between the different salts, you can't just say it's salty. The, the type of salt that is actually present is vitally important for understanding the stability of, of the ice and the water present. So you have a range of eutectic temperatures, so the lowest point that you can have liquid water. Uh, you know, so um, potassium chloride is also similarly up here. Uh, magnesium sulfate only depresses the freezing point by maybe four, four degrees. Uh, but you have things like magnesium perchlorate or magnesium chlorate that can reduce the freezing point by almost 80 degrees. And so, you know, thinking about uh, what that actually means for the ocean, if it's a predominantly sulfate or potentially carbonate salt, it's probably a warmer ocean than it would be if there's chlorides present. So it's kind of this catch-22 where, yes, maybe chlorides mean that it's easier to have liquid water, but uh, it is colder and life doesn't tend to like that <laughs> really cold, high salinity, um, environment. So thinking about how to actually detect these, uh, we can compare it to uh, other salts, for instance, sulfates. So on the left here, uh, you have magnesium sulfate 7 h or epsomite that we've seen and heard about so far, even in this meeting, uh, and then magnesium chloride 6H2O in purple. Uh, so similar uh, you have magnesium and you have a similar number of waters and so you have a very similar spectra. Uh, this is the same issue, if you will, uh, with other things like gypsum or bassanite, so calcium sulfate 2H2O and magnesium chlorate 2H2O. And so you see these structures are actually dependent on the cation, the magnesium or calcium, and water. And the reason for that is if you actually start looking at the structure of these. Uh, so I started working with a group in the chemistry department at Northern Arizona University, and we are trying to understand and predict where the vibrational <coughs> modes will actually occur. So here's just uh, a GIF of each of them. So you have the hexahydrite, magnesium sulfate 6H2O, uh, magnesium perchlorate 6H2O and, and magnesium chloride 6H2O, 6H2O. And one of the things that you should notice is that in each of these cases, you have almost the exact same molecule. You have magnesium in yellow, and you have six waters bound to the magnesium. And then the perchlorate or the sulfate or the chloride are separate from that. So when you're actually thinking about the near infrared spectra, you are seeing magnesium and water, not so much the sulfate. It does, they do affect it, but what you're really seeing is the, um, 
uh, effect of the cation and the water. And so that's why when you look at similar hydration states across different salts, they all appear very similar to each other. So um, we started looking with uh, magnesium perchlorate, um, 6H2O, and here are the predicted uh, <clears throat> fundamental modes for the different uh, bends and stretches. You have water. This is showing the symmetric bend of water. Mm, no. Well, the <laughs> let's see. Yeah. So um, the bend. And so then we have also perchlorate. So perchlorate, uh, there's bends and stretches between the chlorine and the oxygen. And if we start looking at some of them and combining them, we can actually see how that lines up with experimental data. So comparing it to magnesium perchlorate that I took in the lab, you can see that one of the most interesting features of magnesium perchlorate uh, is this right around 2.12. There's uh, perchlorate hydrates have this uh, band and none of the other chlorine salts do. So not anhydrous perchlorate, uh, but just perchlorate hydrates. And so we wanted to see, is there a combination of the water and perchlorate modes that can get you close? And kind of. <laughs> um, we, this is a work in progress. We just started this. Um, I have a space grant student working on it. Uh, and so I think it's a interesting avenue to, to follow. Uh, I'll just show some other uh, spectra that I've collected in the lab and the importance of collecting it at the right temperature. Uh, so here's three pairs of spectra. Uh, the top pair is magnesium chloride 2H2O. Uh, the middle pair is 4H2O and the bottom pair is 6H2O. And then within each pair, the bottom spectra is at room temperature and the upper is at 80 Kelvin. So you can see quite a difference between the room temperature and the Europa temperature spectra. In particular, if you look um, at the 6H2O at this uh, 1.25-ish region here, it's uh, almost a shoulder. It's, it's, and then at the lower temperatures becomes a lot narrower um, and becomes more resolved as a band and then even splits into a triplet. And again, this is, I theorize, <laughs> that you're really, you're resolving the water pairs. So you see there's actually three pairs of water, and so you're getting a triplet here. Whereas in the 4H2O, you would have only four waters, so you'd have two pairs and you have a doublet here. Um, so you're actually seeing more features at these colder temperatures. So it's really important that we're getting uh, spectra at the correct temperatures for the planetary body we're studying. Uh, so uh, Liget used some of the chlorine salt spectra that I published using VLT Symphony to map and they think that uh, through, through modeling, through linear mixing modeling, uh, find that the chloride maps pretty well as does the perchlorate. And there actually are a little bit of some differences where they map to. So this is magnesium chloride, and it is pretty well centered at zero, uh, whereas the perchlorate is more on the 270 region. So could there be, you know, thinking about, again, chlorine coming up or chlorides and then radiolysis or bombardment or, you know, I, I don't know. But it's interesting to see the difference in um, where these salts are actually occurring. And then you can see if you combine the magnesium chloride and magnesium perchlorate, you're getting up to almost um, a third of the weight percent uh, as these magnesium chlorine salts, according to their modeling. Uh, so uh, an interesting thing is to start thinking about other wavelength regions. <laughs> and uh, so I collected, this is all room temperature, but it does show that there are some fundamental modes of the perchlorate. So it's this uh, ClO2 stretch at these wavelengths. Uh, and then in perchlorate as well, you get fundamentals out in this region. 
Uh, potentially, this is a really interesting feature. You see it in both the anhydrous and the hydrated uh, forms of the perchlorate. So this is in the region where mice will still actually be able to get out there. So that could be potentially interesting. It needs to be done um, at the right temperature. <laughs> but uh, this is something that I would like to study further. Uh, so we actually had some time on IRTF with TEXIS, which is a high resolution um, spectrometer. And here you can see the leading hemisphere versus the trailing hemisphere. So it's just a single disk integrated spectrum. Uh, and if you ratio the two, so trailing divided by leading to just kind of pull out the differences between the two hemispheres, uh, there is something here, for sure, there is a difference between the leading and the trailing. Um, it does happen to line up with sodium chlorate. I don't know. More work to be done. <laughs> uh, but that's very interesting. You, you do, again, see some interesting uh, shapes and features in this, uh, in this wavelength region. So this is just from 10 to 11 microns. So we would like to extend the wavelength region. Uh, I've also started uh, using Lowell's Discovery Channel Telescope. It's a 4.3 meter telescope uh, in Arizona. And this is hot off the presses. I literally got this data last week, so I have no analysis on it except to say that um, we can do the near infrared region um, from about 1.4 to 2.5. And I'm really excited to start. We can monitor it continuously. I can get, you know, it doesn't take very long to get a spectrum um, with this telescope and this instrument. So it's potentially a good way to monitor things that, that are happening. Unfortunately, it is also a disk integrated spectrum. So there's limitations on what we can do with that. Um, so to summarize, uh, the non IC, non sulfuric acid component likely includes chlorine salts based on some modeling uh, and observational data. And really, it is important to make sure that we're distinguishing what kind of salt is there. Obviously, this has been said many times, we want to know the composition of the surface. Uh, but I just wanted to uh, emphasize that you can't just say salt. The type of salt is, is very important. Uh, and some of the work that we're trying to work on future uh, studies to continue collecting observations on the near-infrared and min-infrared. Um, there's also a visible spectrometer uh, on the DCT, so it's a potential avenue. Uh, also trying to understand the emission spectra. We have some new faculty at Northern Arizona University uh, that I'm excited to collaborate with. So Christopher Edwards has a lot of ex expertise with um, the emission spectra. And we're talking about building a chamber there. Uh, and Mark Loeffler, who has been mentioned multiple times this uh, <clears throat> today, uh, has also just started at NAU. He's been there about a year, and he's building um, some lab equipment there as well. Uh, and huh, if we get money, <laughs> we do have a PDART in to measure opt optical constants from the UV to the min-infrared for these chlorine salts. So fingers crossed. Thank you. So first, good luck on the the P dart. I mean, we I really want to see those optical constants. So, yes. uh, um, but on the other hand, there's a lot of structure in the perchlorates, and and uh, some of them are in the U new USGS Spectral Library, and there's a lot of uh, structure in the um, three to five micron region. We don't see those in any of the Galan satellite data or anywhere Saturn data either. Um, there's also a very strong 3 point, uh, I mean 2.4 micron band in the perchlorates. Mm -hmm. We don't see that in, in the NIMS data. So uh, it seems to me that perchlorates in particular are, are pretty rejected. 
things like sodium salts like NaCl, mm -hmm. um, chlorides, they have uh, nice sharp absorptions in the UV. Unfortunately, Clipper doesn't have that range, but, but there are UV spectra of, of Europa and, and we don't see those features either. So um, I don't see the evidence for, you'd have to do an exact match, but I don't see it matching any of the near, I, near IR bands that you won't find another band rejects them. Well, the 2.4 is basically a large inflection point, and that's pretty standard across all these salts, and the per hydrated perchlorates in particular have it. Um, and then thinking about also some of the other things, the anhydrous perchlorate, there's no reason to say that you can't have anhydrous perchlorate because that looks the same as NaCl in the near infrared, and it, all the way up into that um, you know, around that three micron region here, I don't know. I mean, this, I think this should be diagnostic. And so if you're not seeing it, then. Yeah, we're not I, seeing those. Okay. So I don't. And the whole structure of the three micron band isn't there either. Okay. So on Mars, we see the, the 2.4 band in the chrism data. Yes. But the uh, structure of the three micron band could be masked by the presence of water because pixels are mixed. And so that could just be masking it out. But I agree with the four micron, five, what is that? 4.5 micron feature? Between four and five. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I haven't seen, I haven't looked at that data. I was going to follow, ask the question about where, where would it be seen in the UV that you mentioned? Uh, in NACL, it's 0.28 microns. A nice sharp band. Other questions? Uh, Jennifer, uh, do you, uh, let's say if we have uh, sodium chloride and other chlorides or, or perchlorates, whatever it is, uh, where could be the source of chlorine? Or where, where, where do we think that it is coming from? Uh, it is from interior or exogenic? Uh, so, my understanding is that it's probably, well, depending on where you see it first, but um, chlorine would be more indicative of an endogenic source you know, from, from the ocean, whereas sulfur is too ambiguous to really necessarily say just because of Ios torus. So I think if we really do see these chlorides um, and or perchlorates or chlorates, <laughs> uh, I think that would be a good indication that we're seeing something from the ocean. So this is just a basic question about the chlorine or the sulfate salts. So you and several other people mentioned that the the chlorine salts would have a lower freezing temperature or a chlorine ocean than a sulfate ocean. So I guess my more maybe simplistic understanding is that the freezing temperature depression when you add stuff to water is just dependent on how much of the molar quantity, right? It's a colligative property. So is that not quite accurate or is it just that some of the, the chlorine salts you can put more of it or not more, it's more soluble in water or is it something else? It's partially related to that. So um, the, the different salts, so for instance, the eutectic composition for magnesium perchlorate is something like 49 weight percent salt. And so you are putting a lot more into it. But uh, it's also the, the charges and the size of the, of the ions. And so you have to take into account the interaction between the ions uh, and, and the water. And so there's a useful parameter called the activity of water that is really helpful in comparing across different salts to see, you know, if you just look at, um, if you put all of the salts in terms of that um, factor, the activity of water, um, you can see that, you know, for instance, the chlorine salts and things like that uh, do depress it further than the sulfate would. And just to, just to follow on off that, um, you're right to say that it's important what the salt is, uh, but also it's important to remember that natural fluids uh, contain their complex mixtures of salts, 
right? So like absolutely, uh, like yeah. two salts will depress. Well, the eutectic point of two salts will be lower than the eutectic of e of either salt. Yes. So once we start factoring in the really complex sort of ion ion interactions and all that stuff, which we don't fully understand at all, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, things get even more complex. So it's 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 important to remember that single salt systems aren't fully representative of nature, really. Absolutely true. It's a lot easier to do single salt stuff in the lab and build from there. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, and then even when you start mixing, I mean, in, in, for the spectra, if you just mix a bunch of salts together, it is incredibly difficult to back out what the salt is, even if you know what it is, uh, you know, a priori. And different salts have different um, kind of strengths, as it were, in, in the spectra. So for instance, if gypsum is present, it's almost certainly going to mask out any other salts. Um, that's more relevant to other planets, but you know, it's, it, it's very important to start thinking about, well, optical constants, and then also doing lab work to mix these different salts and see how it affects the spectra. Um, I noticed that the uh, back to the four point whatever micron band there that's poking up uh, it gets smaller as the hydration state uh, increases and similar for epsomite or magnesium sulfate you know its features mush out as it becomes more solvated yes. so that a uh, higher hydration state could a higher hydration state of the perchlorate perhaps match your rope a little bit better and uh, and those experiments be done? Is that material even stable at Europa temperatures? So uh, for sodium, the highest hydration state is two. For magnesium, the highest hydration state is six. So what you see here in green is the highest hydration for magnesium. Calcium, you can get up to eight. And these are all probably stable at, th these highest hydration states are gonna be what's stable on Europa anyway. Okay, so this is different than sulfate where you can have a almost a, a continuum number of hydration states mm -hmm. so that this actually is a stoichiometric relationship that is preferred. yeah so magnesium you. you have anhydrous two four and six um, sodium you have anhydrous one and two um, the calcium I think they're also even just two four six and eight uh, magnesium chloride you have you don't have a seven that we know of you know, so a lot of these things are really interesting. So, of course, from when they started thinking about magnesium sulfate, they assumed it was 12, was the highest hydration state, until someone finally went and did XRD and realized, oh, it's 11. And so the highest hydration state of magnesium sulfate is 11. But uh, the highest hydration state of magnesium chloride, which is the most similar, is 12. But I don't actually know of any XRDs that have confirmed that. <laughs> Um, so you know, kind of understanding the structure of these things it could be important too. I agree. And not only that, but perhaps irradiation, which messes oh, up the structure, yeah. would then allow you to have a larger or more random number of waters, right? Yeah, potentially. 